Good morning. Welcome to St. Matthew's and uh, a special welcome to um, our brothers and sisters in Christ at, over at St. Uh, Bartholomew who are uh, intentionally worshiping with us in the month of July. So welcome and we're going to sing together a hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. My soul, the King of Heaven, to His feet your tribute bring, handsome, healed, restored, forgiven. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. May we find peace in your service and in the world to come. See you face to face through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it the world and all who dwell therein. For it is he who founded it upon the seas and made it firm upon the rivers of the deep. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord and who can stand in his holy place? 
those who have clean hands and a pure heart, who have not pledged themselves to falsehood, nor sworn by what is a fraud. They shall receive a blessing from the Lord and a just reward from the God of their salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, of those who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, lift them high, O everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, lift them high, O everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. A reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who are the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Now I invite you to sing another hymn, Judge Eternal, Throned in Splendor. Sorry. 
had your own endeavor, cleave a darkness with your sword, cheer the faint and feed the hungry with the richness of your word. Cleanse the body of this nation through the glory of the Lord. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is written in the sixth chapter of the Gospel according to Mark, beginning at the 14th verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And I speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I, I wonder if this is one of those rare uh, moments in, in the lectionary where we have an entire gospel passage where Jesus only makes one real appearance, and that's only the mention of his, his name. The, the entire gospel passage is this, is this diversion that happens in, in Mark. It's very interesting. I just don't know if there's another spot in the lectionary where we... We really don't hear a lot about Jesus in the gospel. Um, we hear about, a lot about Herod, uh, Herod Antipas, and, and the fate of, of John the Baptist. So uh, part of the, the interesting thing about this passage that I'll mention really briefly in terms of the, the context of where we find it, Mark's gospel, I, I am convinced that uh, by a, a professor that I had, that Mark's gospel, it's the shortest of the gospels, it's the most... Um, Immediate, there's something, it's, um, the disciples are always going immediately from here, immediately to there, everything's quick, everything moves. Uh, I'm convinced that it, it was originally performed, uh, kind of like a, a monologue. This was, this was a thing that was done in, in that time. You'd put in a small coin, go into a tent, and you'd hear um, an actor or a, a, someone who, who has memorized a, a dialogue, this, is, uh, this genre, this Greek bios genre, you hear the story of a great life, uh, a great life lived. 
and this would have been performed. Um, it takes, if you, if you hear the Gospel of Mark performed, it takes, um, I think, about an hour, hour and a half, I think, from beginning to end. And there's a little uh, spot where you could almost put an intermission uh, after the transfiguration. That's about the halfway mark, a uh, big triumphant um, moment. And um, this story also serves a very effective narrative piece if, you're, if it's being performed. Jesus has begun his ministry and he's been doing all these amazing healing, uh, healings throughout, the, throughout Galilee and he's been calling his disciples and all of these challenging uh, and exciting moments have just occurred. Everything that, that you heard last Sunday was the build-up to this, right? Jesus is doing these amazing things. He goes back to his hometown. Ultimately, he is not really received very uh, very well. Uh, and then he, he commissions his disciples, who almost seem to be, have, be more of Jesus' family than Jesus' actual family. He commissions the disciples to go out around the countryside and perform miraculous healings and uh, ex, uh, exercise demons and all of that stuff. And, and he equips them. He says, don't take a lot of stuff with you. Rely on the hospitality uh, of others and trust in your, your abilities as, as, uh, as healers and teachers. And off they go. And then we cut to this story with, with Herod, and we find out what happens to John the Baptist that we encountered at the beginning of this, this gospel. And then when this, this sordid tale comes to a close, the next, the next scene that my guess is we will encounter next week is when the disciples return from their, their great adventures to, to report back to, back to Jesus. So this is sort of its own contained thing, its own contained story in the middle of the gospel of mark so what do we do with it what do we do with this story um one of the things i think it's, it is important for us also to recognize about this story this is this is not hyperbole this is not um the gospel writers trying to cast the herodians in a bad light the herodians were exactly like this. Uh, Herod Antipas, um, all of the Herod's uh, children, Herod, Herod the Great himself, immensely, immensely powerful individuals, ruthless, paranoid, um, lived very sordid lives. Um, this is a pretty decent snapshot of the kinds of things that happened in the court of, of all of the Herodians in this in this time. This is a pretty good picture. And it's, it's, saying, it's saying a lot of things uh, in one little snapshot. The, the stories of, of King Herod are told to a people that historically have expected a lot from their kings and a lot from their prophets. If you think about the people of Israel, the historic people of Israel, if you think, someone like, think about someone like King David or someone like Samuel, the expectation is that the king is devout and loves God and loves his people, something that Herod Antipas tragically is, isn't really able to do either, or he's, he's too much of a fool to really be able to go too far with his, with his uh, hearing of John the Baptist's teachings. But the king is supposed to, to love God and love his people and listen to the prophets. The, the role of the prophets are to be in the court of the king and to be the voice of God. And one of the things that happens throughout the history of Israel is, is the prophets are not, the real prophets are often not the ones saying to the king exactly what the king wants to hear. Uh, the false prophets are often the ones that say, actually, everything's going to be all right. All the decisions you're making are solid. Everything's going to be fine. It's often the prophet saying things, saying words, uh, speaking on behalf of God that things are not going okay, that the king has made some errors, perhaps some grievous errors. Uh, recall when King David hears, you are the man, you are the one when he, he that, that terrible scandal with Bathsheba, right? That, that's a, that's a, a brutal teaching for uh, and a brutal moment of, of indictment that the, the prophet uh, hands to, to David. The prophets are supposed to be challenging, they're supposed to be difficult to hear, but there's something about truth if you are, are someone that, that inclines ultimately towards God and towards justice and righteousness, there's something about truth that we find 
uh, appealing, even when it's hard to hear. And so what's supposed to be happening in these moments is the king invites a, a prophet, a, a genuine real prophet like John the Baptist, into his court. He hears the difficult messages that John has to offer. He doesn't like it, but he knows that it's true, and he continues to and invite him to be there to offer these very tough teachings. And of course, what happens in this time is, is Mark is saying to us that that is no longer the case. That culture is gone. And in fact, when John uh, preaches the truth, he is imprisoned and he is executed in a really terrible, sordid way that suggests that, uh, you know, not even in a, in a sort of a grand heroic way, but rather uh, Herod Antipas, probably drunk at his birthday party, has John the Baptist executed. And maybe he, imagine he, you can easily imagine that he's so inebriated he might not even know exactly what's happened until afterwards, right? These kinds of, these are the kinds of rulers that are ruling in Galilee in this time. Any faith that we might want to place in the kings and, and, and the, the ministry of prophets um, perhaps is misplaced. There's, there's, there's a, a tradition that happens that, that Mark kind of alludes to a bit that perhaps John the Baptist was Elijah. There's a long history of ex expecting Elijah to return, a really heroic figure of the, um, of the Old Testament. He, he famously flies away in a flaming chariot, and there's a, there's a great tradition that one day Elijah is going to return, and Elijah will herald the end times. And again, this is this very dark reading. What if John the Baptist was Elijah, and Elijah had returned, and Elijah was there in the court of the king, telling the king what was true and what was just and what was right, and Elijah ultimately, his fate was he was executed in this, in this terrible way. So whether you're hoping for justice and, and righteousness among the, the people in authority, or you're waiting for a heroic return of Elijah, one of the great prophets, your, your, uh, your hopes are, are misplaced, says Mark to us. You must find and place your faith in other places through following Jesus to the cross, right? A very, very different path. You think about those early Christians, they were not trying to convince Herod Antipas or uh, any of the other uh, tetrarchs, right, the great rulers of that time, they were not trying to convince them that they were right. They were not writing diligent, or diligently written letters, like carefully written letters to people in power. They knew that the, the politics of their day were corrupt and would not listen to the prophetic words. So the, the, the church began on a very, very different path, where the journey begins actually with you and with me. The Christian journey starts with you and I, empowering ourselves with transforming our lives, you and me, to powerless people that don't have the power of a great king. We don't have the words of a great prophet, but we have the capacity to transform our lives. And we have this belief that like a mustard seed planted in the wilderness that can spread far and wide and can never be uh, removed from the wilderness once it has sort of taken root, we have this belief that if you and me can embrace the love of God and become followers of Jesus, something transformative can take place and also something far more permanent than having the luck of a good uh, or even great king or the uh, temporary misfortune of having a terrible king. All of that, it's a different kind of transformation that starts to take place in the early church. It begins with you and with me. Is that true for us today? I mean, I think so. I think there's something really beautiful about this message for you and for me. Think about how desperately we want to live in a world that has a predictable order and stability to it. Think about how desperately we want everything in the political realm to be boring. Uh, how, you know, if we want to make any if, we want, if there's any surprises, we want it to be coming from us. Uh, we don't like random things. We don't like random diseases. We don't like, uh, we don't like a world that is chaotic, disordered. We don't like being surprised by uh, terrible fear or terrible destruction. There's, I think 
in each one of us is a, is a desperate desire to have an ordered, uh, stable world. And in a time of great chaos like this, I've seen, and I'm sure you have too, some very strange attempts to find, to find order among the chaos. Right? I've, I've, I've uh, received some, some uh, I've had some conversations with folks who have family and friends who are starting to embrace conspiracy theories, right? Cons I don't know if you you've have any family or friends that have embraced new conspiracy theories that, that I'll give you, if you haven't, I'll, I'll describe sort of very briefly the theme, which is it might seem that everything is chaotic and disordered right now, but in fact, everything is actually highly ordered and highly structured because billionaires have created a virus to, uh, to become wealthy themselves and um, to enrich themselves, and it's all a conspiracy. And, and uh, what the conspiracy essentially is saying is everything is going as the wealthy billionaire class has planned, and don't be deceived. Um, go get back to your lives. Everything is actually totally normal. This COVID business is a conspiracy. That's the idea, right? So it's a conspiracy theory essentially saying everything is stable, everything is ordered, everything, even though it's unjust, there is a, there is a clear and obvious reason for this calamity that has taken hold of the world. And uh, we don't have to worry about chaotic things happening. Everything was planned. That, that might sound like something that's... Um, I don't know, terrible or frightening, but that those would be words of comfort to somebody where they'd rather live in a world that's unjust than in a world that might have chaos in it. Right? We might ra we'd rather live in a world where there are unjust rulers than seemingly no competent rulers or rulers that seem to be unable to stop things like global warming, stop things like a pandemic. So I think throughout our history, we have these moments where society veers on the edge or falls into, into chaos. And we desperately want to create a world where there is actually a predictable structure. And I think one of the reasons why the message of Jesus is so resilient, especially in times of chaos and fear, is Jesus charts an entirely different path. He says, do not place expectations or hope on worldly powers or expectations and hope on that everything's going to turn out all right. If you follow me, you're head to the cross. It's a rather terrifying path in a way. But there's something um, deeply comforting and beautiful about you and me knowing that the love of God can pervade whatever political or social landscape we have in our world, that you and me can love God together. We can become servants of God through Jesus Christ. And we can build a community, regardless of what's going on around us, we can build a community together that is loving and peaceful and hopeful, and we can share in that and chart a course like a, like a ship in a storm. We can create uh, a community and we can create a life regardless of what's going on. Are they, are they embracing the prophets or killing the prophets? Are the kings great or the kings terrible? It doesn't matter. We don't have to wait for political change to follow Jesus, to love God, to love one another, to have our own lives transformed by the love of God. So I, I think that this, I mean, you know, I'm not an apolitical person. I think I, I desperately want, you know, I want there to be really effective political leaders to make sure everybody's safe and, I don't know, make sure the roads work and make sure that the vaccines get out to everybody. I'm, I, I love all of this stuff to work really, really well, but it's important to, sometimes we can have an instinct to, to, to rest our um, hopes of salvation on political success or on social success. And I think that's where Jesus has, um, offers us a path of, of, um, a path of salvation that can withstand whatever's happening in, in our world today. So I'm going to leave that with you. I, uh, it's one of the, it's, it's one of the stranger gospels we have because it's this, it's this sordid tale of this is how the world is, uh, that sets the context for Jesus. It's so important to remember that the message in the gospel of Jesus is not some idyllic message for some halcyon time that doesn't exist. This is a gospel message that, that actually speaks the most clearly in times of chaos and fear and disorder. That is when the words of Jesus, I think, actually are, are the most clear and the most needed. So if you're feeling like the world is a little bit topsy-turvy, um, the gospel of Jesus Christ is, is here 
uh, and these words are here for you. Amen. Let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for all in need. We give you thanks for the opportunity to live in this country, even though there are times of trouble right now. We ask for wisdom, compassion, and care as we seek to find ways that we can live together in harmony and peace. Today, we especially pray for the Indigenous peoples. We pray for the Queen, for the Prime Minister, for all who govern. We pray for Mary Simons as she begins her term as Governor General of Canada. We ask you to bless all of them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our church throughout the world. Especially we remember the Episcopal Diocese of the Philippines. We pray too for our diocesan staff, the staff of our parishes, for Jeff Chapman and David Clooney, for the wardens and all leaders in this church and St. Bart's, that may, you may fill them with your Holy Spirit. They make plans and decisions for the life of your church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the world, for the peoples in lands where there is war, famine, and where there are other tragic situations. Show and incline all to do your will that peace and prosperity may come for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, you know that there have been so many challenges as we dealt with COVID-19 over and above all the normal challenges of daily life. We need your help and guidance as we keep in mind those who have asked for our prayers. For those who are troubled, confused, estranged, lonely, in grief, in pain, addicted, or suffering in any way. The people of St. Bart's bring before you Anne, Ron, Joanne, Harriet, Dawn, Christina, Hannah and family, and Harriet and family. Those of us at St. Matthew's especially remember Emma, Malachi, Mary Bridget, Virginia, Doug, Becky, Layla, Anne, Isabel, Jean, and Russ, Derek, Peter, Myla, Andre, and Andy, Grace, and Sally. Lord, you know all these needs, and we pray for them those people, and also for the, those who come to mind, knowing that you know even before we ask and will hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
We pray for those who have passed from this life into God's nearer presence, as well as for those who mourn. We pray for the Indigenous children's graves that have been found. We pray for Chip Sangster and her family, Derwin, Emily, and Warwick. We pray for Peter Sims and his parents, Anne and John, and his brothers, Michael and Andrew, who also mourn along with many friends. We pray for Barbara McGinnis, her husband, Glenn, daughters, Leah and Emily. We give you thanks for the lives that they led and the love that they shared. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for refugees the world over. We pray for those who are hoping to come here, for those that are already here, and for the challenges that they face and the challenges that are faced by the FACES group and those who care for them. We pray for those in refugees camp, refugee camps and the terrible circumstances that they're living under. And we ask, Lord, that you just move in here and, and make life easier for all of them. Lord, in your mercy, for our prayer. We give you thanks for all who are celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. We pray for Sally and Ross Cleary. We pray for Mary Bush. We also pray for Jack Victor Goddard, Goddard who is being baptized today in Florida. We thank you that you're present at all times and in all places with each and every one of us. Guide us, show us your way, and fill our hearts with love for you and for one another. In these prayers we add in the name of your blessed Son, Jesus. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. So, three quick announcements before our recessional hymn. One, I'm going to be resuming my curbside visits um, for the next three weeks in July. On July 14th, 21st, and 28th, I'm going to be outside the church on the First Avenue side from 10 a.m., to 12 p.m. when I'm going to come into the church to lead the online Bible study. So you can, you can catch me online at noon on Zoom if you, want to, um, if you want to see me that way. So that's happening uh, the next three weeks. Two, um, Conversations is on pause. We normally are do, we're doing Conversations uh, at 9 a.m. So if you're checking out the service, I, if you were looking for Conversations this morning, that's what was going on there. And um, hopefully we've given every, everyone enough warning and, and we're, we're going to we're planning to resume some version of that in the fall but more to come on that and uh i and it, just a welcome once again to to saint bart's uh who was with us for worship this sunday last sunday for the next few sundays and then we're going to go over there um starting in in august so so i hope you feel welcome there's a coffee hour that follows the service online on zoom i'll be there for that uh coffee hour to to, to greet you so so um uh, it's, uh, I hope you feel welcome and hopefully, and, uh, and we look forward to, to being and worshiping with you. All right. So the recessional hymn is, uh, may the grace of Christ, our savior. of Christ. 
this service has ended, but your service has just begun. Go into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.